Good morning. morning. Welcome to worship on this 13th Sunday after Pentecost. A few things of note for you. First of all, we are celebrating Holy Communion this morning. Please know that no matter where you are in your life or faith journey, you are welcome to participate in Holy Communion. The gift of God's grace received in the sacrament is free for all people. A few calendar items of note. This Saturday, September 10th, is God's Work Our Hands Day. It's a day of service. We will be gathering here in our parking lot with our wildfire partners for a breakfast, a short worship, and then service projects at various stations out there. So join us here on Saturday at 9.30 for that. And then Sunday, next Sunday, September 11th, is Homecoming Sunday. Sunday school and forums resume, so get your kids registered for Sunday school if you have not done so. Uh, And then join us for our homecoming tailgate party and potluck. Uh, Grilled meat and dessert will be provided, but you are invited to bring a dish to share as well. There will be fun and games and food, so come be a part of that next Sunday as things resume for the new program year. Uh, And of course, many other program year activities are resuming or have resumed, such as choir, rehearsals on Wednesdays at 7, Uh, Bible study will be coming up after, uh, Tuesday Bible study will resume the Tuesday after Homecoming Sunday, Uh, confirmation, other things. Check out your bulletin for all the things that are resuming as the new program year starts. All right, I think that is all I have as far as announcements. So let us now center ourselves and prepare ourselves for worship by turning to the confession and forgiveness printed in our bulletin. We gather in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who is eager to forgive and who loves us beyond our days. Amen. Dear friends, together let us acknowledge our failure to love this world as Jesus does. God of mercy and forgiveness, we confess that sin still has a hold on us. We have harmed your good creation. We have failed to do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with you. Turn us in a new direction. Show us the path that leads to life. Be our refuge and strength on the journey. Through Jesus Christ, our Redeemer and friend. Amen. Beloved of God, your sins are forgiven and you are made whole. God points the way to new life in Christ, who meets us on the road. Journey now in God's abiding love through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We sing together our gathering hymn, number 880. Please stand as you are able.
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. I have faith. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy for this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, and defend us, gracious Lord. The Lord be with you. Let us pray together. Direct us, O Lord God, in all our doings with your continual help, that in all our works, begun, continued, and ended in you, we may glorify your holy name. And finally, by your mercy, bring us to everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen.
First reading, Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 15 through 20. See, I have set before you today life and prosperity, death and adversity. If you obey the commandments of the Lord your God that I am commanding you today by loving the Lord your God, walking in his ways, and observing his commandments, decrees, and ordinances, then you shall live and become numerous, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land that you are entering to possess. But if your heart turns away, and you do not hear but are led astray to bow down to other gods and serve them, I declare to you today that you shall perish. You shall not live long in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to enter and possess. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you, before your, before your life and death, blessings and curses. Choose life so that you and your descendants may live, lo may you live loving the Lord, your God, obeying him and holding fast to him, for that means life to you and length of days, so that you may live in the land that the Lord swore to you, to your ancestors, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Holy wisdom, holy words. Second reading is from Philemon, chapter 1, verses 1 through 21. Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our dear friend and co-worker, to Aphia, our sister, to Archie, Archiphias, our fellow soldier, and to the church and your worker, to Aphia... To in your church, to in your house. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. When I remember you in my prayers, I always thank my God because I hear of your, of your love for all the saints and your faith toward the Lord Jesus. I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective and you perceive all the good that we do for Christ. I have intent indeed received much joy and encouragement from your love because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you my brother for this reason though i am bold enough in christ to command you to do your duty yet i would rather appeal to you on the basis of love and i paul do this as an old man and do not also as a prisoner of christ jesus 
I am appealing to you for my child, Onismus, whose father I have become during my imprisonment. Formerly, he was useless to me, to you, but now he is indeed useful both to you and to me. I am sending him, that is, my own heart, back to you. I wanted to keep him with me so that he might be of service to me in your place during my imprisonment for the gospel. But I prefer to do nothing without your consent in order that your own good deed might be voluntary and not something forced. Perhaps this is the reason he was separated from you for a while, so that you might have him back forever. No longer as a slave, but more than a, than a slave, a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. So if you consider me your own partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. If he has wronged you in any way or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will repay it. I, w I say nothing about owing o your owing me even your own self. Yes, brother, let me have this benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your own obedience, I am benefit from you in the Lord. In Christ, confident of your own obedience, I'm writing to you knowing that you will do even more than I say. Holy wisdom, holy words. The Holy Gospel according to Luke. Glory to you, Lord. Now large crowds were traveling with Jesus, and he turned and said to them, Whoever comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and even life itself, cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry the cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, does not first sit down and estimate the cost to see whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it will begin to ridicule him, saying, this fellow began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going out to wage war against another king, will not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to oppose the one who comes against him with 20,000. If he cannot, then, while the other is still far away, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So therefore, none of you can become my disciple if you do not give up all your possessions. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. My family was visiting my aunt, uncle, and cousins at their home in California many years ago. I can't quite remember how old I was, but my youngest cousin had to have been four or five. Her name is Erica, which would put me at around 11, so a long time ago. We were having a family game night playing charades. How many of you have played charades? Yes, thumbs up, all right. So you take turns pulling a word out of a hat and you attempt to act them out so that your team might correct the guess, might guess the correct word. So when it was Erica's turn, four or five, she began acting out as soon as the timer went off. And she held her hand out and she started pacing back and forth a smile on her face. And the words from my family started flying. Walk, cane, old. And she shook her head no to each response. At a loss, we started repeating things, but in a slightly different way. You know how you do in charades. 
So like old lady walking or walking the dog. At this last answer, her eyes got wide and she started nodding her head, encouraging us to go on. We were close, but not there yet. We tried to get her to take a different approach, do something different. But being four or five, she could not think of any other ways to act out her word. And finally, the timer beeped. We collectively groaned. And her mom said, what was the word? And my cousin said with a huge smile on her face, happy. The word was happy. Dogs make me happy, and you have to walk dogs. So that's what I was doing, walking my dog. We burst into giggles, the little kid logic so evident and innocent and delightful. If charades is about acting, about acting something out instead of using your words to teach or describe, then Paul in his letter to Philemon is playing an epic game of charades. Faith charades, if you will. He is acting out the very message he has written in letter upon letter, in word after word after word. He is acting out, living out the message of Jesus he has spent his entire adult life communicating through the written word. In fact, Philemon is the only one of Paul's letters that does not describe the teachings of Jesus or put them into some kind of well-thought-out theology. Because this letter isn't about the message, the words, the good news. It's about putting it into practice. It's about embodying those words. It's about acting out the good news. This letter, the letter to Philemon, is Paul's shortest. It is only one chapter long, and you have just heard all but four verses, the final four, some concluding greetings this very morning. So check that one off your list. Paul is writing this letter to Philemon, who is a wealthy Christian, from one of the churches Paul has visited. And Paul is writing this letter from prison. He's writing it because Philemon's slave, Onesimus, has run away. Now, as a wealthy land-owning man in the first century, it should not surprise us that Philemon would have slaves. It was the culturally acceptable thing, and even if people knew that it wasn't awesome and didn't make a ton of sense, it's how the world worked at that time. A scholar, N.T. Wright, likens it to cars today. He says, we know that they're bad for the environment, and it isn't great to be so dependent on them, but we aren't about to give them up. Right? So Philemon has slaves. And one of them, Onesimus, has run away. He has run away to Ephesus, where Paul is in jail, and he has been visiting Paul, and in fact become a Christian himself. He has been useful to Paul working for him and helping him while he is in jail. Running away as a slave was a serious offense, right? Paul knows that something terrible awaits Onesimus if he sends him back to Philemon. And while Paul can't get in the middle of matters between a slave and a slave owner, he sure is going to try. He is going to practice what he has been preaching about who Jesus is and how we are called to follow him. And he is going to appeal to Philemon to do the same. Right? In verse 8, Paul says, Though I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do your duty, I would rather appeal to you on the basis of love. Paul goes on to say, I am sending him, that is my own heart, back to you. I wanted to keep him with me so that he might be of service to me in your place during my imprisonment for the gospel, but I preferred to do nothing without your consent in order that your good deed might be voluntary and not something forced. Now, if I were Philemon opening up this letter, I would start rolling my eyes right around this point. It seems to me Paul is laying it on pretty thick. Right? He's saying, well, I could just order you to do the right thing, but I want you to choose the right thing. And I would never do anything without your consent, but... 
right? Paul is appealing to Philemon to treat Onesimus fairly upon his return. And really, Paul is appealing to Philemon to treat Onesimus more than fairly, to treat him not as a slave at all, but as a brother. Paul says, have him back forever, no longer as a slave, but more than a slave, a beloved brother. Paul wants Philemon to see Onesimus as an equal member of the body of Christ, to recognize that he is no less than anyone else in the kingdom of God, to accept him as a partner in the work of Jesus. Paul is appealing to Philemon to act out his faith, to do not as the world would do or demand, but to do as Jesus would do and demand. And Paul is leading by example. Paul says in verse 17, So if you consider me your partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. If he has wronged you in any way or owes you anything, charge that to my account. Paul is standing in the gap for Onesimus. He is saying to Philemon, whatever you're going to do or whatever you would like to do to Onesimus, do it to me. Does that sound familiar? Isn't this exactly what Jesus does? Doesn't he, from the cross, say, Father, forgive them, they don't know what they do? Doesn't he, arms stretched out, say, charge it to my account? Doesn't he die so that we don't have to? Paul, in this letter, is walking the way of faith. He is acting out his faith, which demands him to be in the business of reconciliation. Because the saving work of Jesus is the saving work of reconciliation. Through Jesus' death and resurrection, we are reconciled to God, brought into relationship with God. Whatever obstacles or division there was, there is no more. We are reconciled. And if we are to live out our faith, then this is the work we are called to do as well. The work of Jesus, the work of Paul, it's the work of you and me. We are to bridge the divide, stand in the gap, bring people together, embrace the one body we have become, enact the partnership we all share. Because in reconciling us to God, Jesus has also reconciled us to one another. Jesus has shattered the labels we use to separate ourselves from one another. Jesus has obliterated the barriers we build to keep us from one another. Jesus has erased the lines we draw to remove ourselves from one another. In Jesus, there is no longer male and female, Jew or Greek, slave or free. We are all equally in need of God's forgiveness. We all equally receive God's grace. We all have equal access to God's mercy and love. And because of this, because Jesus has reconciled us to God and to one another, because we all stand equal before God, because our barriers have been shattered and our divisions have been overcome, because of this, our call as followers of Jesus is to work for this same reconciliation in the world. Where are there labels that need to be removed for the health and well-being of all? Where are there barriers that need to be broken for the abundance and flourishing of all? Where are there lines that need to be erased for the dignity and equality of all? This is where we need to be. This is where Paul is standing in the gap for Onesimus and advocating that he be a brother, not a slave. This is where Jesus is breaking the barriers that keep us from God with his own body. Where is it that we need to be? The letter to Philemon might be Paul's shortest, it is, but it is one of his most important. 
For in it, Paul is reminding Philemon that the divisions of the world have no place in the life of a Christian. He is reminding Philemon that the priorities or the status or the values or the behaviors of those who don't know Jesus have to be different from those that do. He is reminding Philemon that the saving news of Jesus is the saving news of reconciliation, and Paul is reminding us of the same. The saving news of Jesus is the saving news of reconciliation for us, and for everyone. Because we have received such an incredible gift ourselves, it is ours to work on on the behalf of others. We are the repairers of the breach, the restorers of the streets, the reconcilers of all. This is how we act out our faith. We have words to describe and teach, sure, but we are called to act to act out what we have received and what we believe. And that, in a charade-style word, is reconciliation. Amen.
With the whole church, let us confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. As scattered grains of wheat are gathered together into one bread, so let us gather our prayers for the church those in need, and all of God's good creation. We pray for the church around the world and for the mission of the gospel. Refresh the hearts of your people. Deepen our understanding of every good thing we share and strengthen our partnerships in the faith. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For the well-being of the earth and all its creatures, for trees and forests, for all that will yield fruit this season, and for streams and other bodies of water, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For the nations and those in authority, for the elected leaders of our towns, states, and country, and for international organizations. Grant wisdom to those who govern and raise up citizens who make decisions in the best interest of their neighbors. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For all in need, for those who suffer from disease, who struggle with homelessness or food insecurity, for those whose family life is difficult, and for all in this community who need your care, especially Jenny Malley, Pat Manning, Ruth Holm, Addie Grimes, and those we name before you in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For this community of faith, for all our labors, begun, continued, and ended in you, that they glorify your holy name. Bless your people with the strength to live into their many vocations for the sake of the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We give thanks for the saints who now rest from their labors. Give us faith like them to love you with all our hearts, and by your mercy, bring us to everlasting life. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gathered together in the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit, gracious God, we offer these and all our prayers to you. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. We share a sign of that peace with each other. We continue with the offering.
We sing together our offertory response. Please stand as you are able. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. You are indeed holy, almighty, and merciful God. You are most holy, and great is the majesty of your glory. You so loved the world that you gave your only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. We give you thanks for his coming into the world to fulfill for us your holy will, and to accomplish all things for our salvation. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people, for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. For as often as we eat of this bread and drink from this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Remembering, therefore, his salutary command, his life-giving passion and death, his glorious resurrection and ascension, and the promise of his coming again, we give thanks to you, O Lord God Almighty, not as we ought, but as we are able. We ask you mercifully to accept our praise and thanksgiving, and with your word and Holy Spirit to bless us, your servants, and these your own gifts of bread and wine, so that we and all who share in the body and blood of Christ may be filled with heavenly blessing and grace, and receiving the forgiveness of sin may be formed to live as your holy people, and be given our inheritance with all your saints. To you, O God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be all honor and glory in your holy church, now and forever. Amen. 
Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Please be seated. A few short instructions. First of all, if you are worshiping with us at home, you are invited to share communion with each other. Uh, If you are worshiping by yourself, then hear these words for you now. The body of Christ given for you and the blood of Christ shed for you. For those of you here in person, you will come down by the center aisle, take an empty cup and come forward and receive the bread in the center and the wine off to the sides. Or if you prefer, you may take a pre-filled cup of grape juice and also if you need it, there's a gluten-free option in the center as well.
Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Let us pray. O God, we give you thanks that you have set before us this feast, the body and blood of your Son. By your Spirit, strengthen us to serve all in need and to give ourselves away as bread for the hungry. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Now may the light of God surround us, the love of God enfold us, and the presence of God watch over and protect us. For wherever we are, our God is also there. We close as we began in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We sing together our mission hymn, number 802. Please stand as you are able. Go in peace with Christ beside you.